I've been an internal medicine physician for over 25 years, and I've never seen a medication that had this powerful an impact on this important and devastating a disease. Here's the front page of, of my newspaper, right? ICU bed uh, capacity reaches a crisis. We have a vaccine. It's not changing that. If we weren't in the dire circumstances that we're in today as a nation, and looking at even a worsening of the situation over the next few weeks, and with the knowledge that the vaccine really is not going to have any impact until several months from now, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We started the fund uh, way uh, back in April uh, when it was clear that we had a, a pandemic and we needed to do something about it. And talking to scientists, it was very clear that Looking at repurposed drugs is the fastest and lowest cost way to address the pandemic. One of the scientists that we funded was Eric Lenzi at Washington University at St. Louis, and he wanted to study the drug fluvoxamine. We have a 12-person scientific advisory board that evaluates all the grant proposals, and we thought this grant proposal had particular merit, so we funded it. In late September, I got a call from Eric Lenzi, the researcher on the project, and he reported to me some startling results. It took about a month uh, for this to be published in uh, the journal, the American Medical Association. And then a week later, there was an outbreak at Golden Gate Fields, 200 uh, person uh, outbreak. And it turned out that the doctor there was familiar with the fluvoxamine study, and he prescribed fluvoxamine to the people at the racetrack. And he had just very extraordinary results. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. David Seftel, who has been the track physician at Golden Gate Fields in Berkeley for the past seven years. I serve as the internal medicine and track physician for Golden Gate Field, which is a congregate living facility at, at the racetrack. I have the opportunity to introduce and to use fluvoxamine in a cohort of 100 and 13 individuals, of which 65 elected to use fluvoxamine, 48 did not. Amongst the 65 that elected, uh, there were no hospitalizations. Amongst the 48 that did not, there was a 12.5% hospitalization rate. This data was extraordinary to me because I had never seen an intervention of any form that had resulted in such a profound reduction in hospitalization. This is a relatively homogeneous population. Of the individuals that elected to take fluvoxamine, there was a bias towards Latino versus white. David, do you want to comment further? Hi, I'm Dr. David Bulwer from the University of Minnesota. I'm a professor of medicine, and I assisted Dr. Seftal in uh, analyzing uh, his, his results. And you know, overall, we're quite uh, excited by the reduction from 12.5% to 0% with fluvoxamine. And this is sort of a quasi-randomized, um, you know, prospective cohort study. And so it's not a perfect randomized trial, but it does provide observational evidence um, that backs up the Lindsay um, clinical trial. And so when we looked at the two subgroups of who took this versus who did not take fluvoxamine, um, the groups are pretty equal. They're basically the same uh, same age in the mid-40s on average, uh, but with a wide, uh, wide range of age from the 20s up into the 80s, and um, roughly uh, equivalent uh, males and females. And when you think about this, there, there would be a, you know, it might be a bias that the people who were more sick uh, would opt for an experimental therapy um, over those who were less sick. And indeed, that was the case where approximately 40% of those uh, who opted to take the fluvoxamine uh, were asymptomatic at time of their initial testing compared to 60% in the control group who did not take the fluvoxamine. Um, otherwise, they were uh, fairly um, equal. Overall, uh, as, as you can uh, hear, that there was a, a reduction in hospitalization. As well, when you we looked at the respiratory rate of, of people, it was elevated initially when they were first tested and actually normalized quicker uh, in the group that received fluvoxamine. By, by day seven, it was uh, almost two points lower in the fluvoxamine group. So uh, I'm Vikas Sakatme, I'm dean of the School of Medicine at Emory University. I'd like to just simply first state that the following views are my own and don't necessarily reflect those uh, of Emory. Uh, so I'm a physician scientist uh, with a particular interest in drug repurposing. We've started some nonprofits uh, around, around this uh, and also extended the scope of this uh, here at Emory uh, by starting a new center focused on drug repurposing. Now, most of my attention has been in cancer, but since the pandemic started, I've been keeping a close eye 
uh, on uh, the kind of drugs that might be useful for treatment of, uh, of COVID patients. And there really are a couple of hundred such drug possibilities based upon data and cell culture and animal models in silico analyses. But when you really look at the number of these that might actually have data in humans, that whittles down to about a dozen. And at the top of that list, in my view, uh, is fluvoxamine. So just to say a few words about the mechanism of action, the reason I'm excited about this is, of course, there is some human data, which we've just heard about, that's quite strong. But there's also good mechanistic rationale. And in particular, uh, this is one of, the, uh, one of the antidepressants in the SSRI category that also have a rather avid uh, interaction with a particular uh, molecule called the sigma-1 receptor. And this is a receptor that plays a role in how when a virus or other stresses uh, impact on a cell uh, can lead to the production of certain uh, cytokines, certain immune uh, relevant molecules uh, in such a way that uh, they might actually be of detriment uh, in COVID patients. And so by giving this drug, you're actually mitigating or modulating that immune response in a way that might be useful for treating COVID. And in fact, there's some nice animal studies. These animal studies are not in, in a uh, SARS-CoV-2 model, but they are in other models that are very relevant, one in a sepsis model and one in a model of multiple sclerosis. Uh, and those cytokine modulations are seen very dramatically in that model at doses that are very relevant to what we use uh, in the human uh, indication in, in psychiatry. So that's sort of what piqued my interest, uh, having a, a lot of um, experience in this whole area of repurposed drugs. There are challenges along the way. There's no drug company really to move an agenda like this forward. Uh, and so it has to move forward in the nonprofit sector with foundations uh, playing a key role, with the government playing a key role. And at the end of the day, of course, to really change the standard of care, one is going to require a large trial. That trial has now begun uh, by the same investigators at WashU. And, and as physicians watching this program, I would encourage you to take all of your COVID positive patients and give them a shot, uh, ask them uh, uh, whether they would be uh, uh, interested in enrolling in this trial. And frankly, I would go further than that. Uh, if you feel that the circumstances warrant, and especially for those patients at high risk for disease progression, they should be encouraged to avail themselves of monoclonal antibody therapy that currently carries an emergency use authorization under these circumstances. But finally, in this group, if they cannot get access to the antibodies because that access is limited, and if they do not wish to enroll in the large randomized fluoxamine study, uh, I would urge physicians to consider off-label use based upon the unique circumstances of their patients, including their risk factors. I believe it's deserving of very serious consideration in the setting of mild to moderate COVID disease. This is an intervention that has minimal side effects, a drug that is exceptionally well understood and appreciated, that has at least four major biochemical and clinical reasons for its efficacy. Anti-inflammatory, antiviral, anticoagulant, and antidepressant. Four compelling reasons that combined with the basic science evidence of sigma-1 activation means that this merits very serious and appropriate consideration by any frontline physician faced with a patient with COVID-19 disease. I think David makes a very good point, uh, worth reiterating again, that there are actually multiple mechanisms at play. I did not get into that earlier, uh, and it is worth noting. And in fact, one of the strengths of some of these repurposed drug studies is that uh, they often affect multiple mechanisms. And so it becomes hard to necessarily pin down one mechanism, uh, but there are multiple ones and they do manifest themselves in some of the animal studies as well. So for those that are interested in enrolling in the clinical trial, that this is, uh, has nationwide enrollment, people can go to the website to find out more information. And uh, fundamentally, persons are followed for two weeks to see what their outcomes are. Uh, their short-term outcomes and then followed longer. But how long the trial will take will be, is based on how quickly persons will volunteer for the trial. And so the, the faster, uh, more people volunteer for the trial, the faster this will be done. And so hopefully this will be, in, be done in a matter of weeks or a month or two. Um, but, uh, you know, it's certainly as fast as possible. And then we can get a, a broader answer that really would, would help inform uh, U.S. as well as international guidelines. <laughs>